waiting for the screen. Oh, they're uh, live streamed. Okay, got it. That's really good. And I don't know if Emilio, you can give me the permission to screen share. That's what I'm waiting on at the moment. <laughs> we forgot to do that as we were chatting right before the event. I also said to the people who came a little bit early that I'm grateful for you doing this in English. Um, I wish I could do this in Portuguese, maybe one day. Um, but I really am particularly interested in, in trying to learn from all of you um, exactly you know, how this may or may not apply to Brazil, what I'm about to say today. All right, still waiting for the screen sharing. Up oh, there we go, got it, okay. So um, can you sip that somehow? There we go. Can you see slides now? Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. I, you know, I sort of live in my head with slides these days. So it turns out that uh, without them, I have no idea what to say. So here we go. Um, so first of all, my talk is called The Party's Over, because what I want to focus on today is the role of elections and in particular of political parties um, in some of the democratic crises that we are living through today. And so we can start here um, by saying that, you know, new autocrats are appearing worldwide under the banner of populism. I have a, a picture of the Brazilian president from yesterday and his appearance um, at the United Nations. Um, but what's really striking is just how all over the world you're seeing this phenomenon of these wildly popular people coming to power and then sort of dismantling their constitutional governments. And what I wanna talk about today is how that's happening and why that's happening and what we might be able to do about it. So for starters, um, this is something quite striking about the world in which we're living. This is uh, the Varieties of Democracy Project out of Sweden, which is one of the leading sort of democracy rating agencies, so to speak. And they've been looking at, at countries um, as they have moved from democracies to less consolidated democracies to hybrid regimes. And in the course of doing that, what's striking is in the last 10 years, um, and I have till 2019 here, but this, the trend is continuing, we're seeing more and more countries sort of going backwards in terms of guarantees of constitutional democracy, respect for constitutional rights protection, um, separation of powers, checks and balances. They have a pretty robust um, measurement of exactly what this means. And so, this is something that isn't just happening in a few places in the world. This is happening in a lot of places in the world, very consequentially for the population uh, at large. Um, and then when we sort of think about, you know, who are who is to blame, so to speak, Dovinovat, as the Russians say, um, this is a this is a little map that shows you a little bit about which of the countries we're talking about. Um, this is VDEM data, and so it measures liberal democracy from 2009 against the horizontal axis and liberal democracy scores along the vertical axis um, from 2019. A country that has not changed at all will be right on, it, on the line. The countries that are above the line improved, the countries below the line um, dropped, and how far you are for the line from the line measures how much you've changed, right? So that's why it's a good kind of picture. So we're kind of interested in the countries that are you know, here in this quadrant um, that are the countries that did quite well 10 or a little over 10 years ago and are doing much worse now. And I might note Brazil is one of them. Um, Hungary, Poland, um, and sort of Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, of course, the US has had some problems, Czech Republic. And so these are countries that we might care about. I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about India. Venezuela is way down here only because much of its democracy slide happened before they started measuring this, right? So, so countries that have gone backwards, these are the ones from the, from the last 10 years or so. And so what I wanna talk about today is like, how is this happening? Like when we say a democracy is going backwards, like what do we mean that is actually happening on the ground? And why is this happening and what is to be done? So I'm gonna talk to you about how democracies are failing um, by law. Um, that a lot of what's happening here is a problem with elections and that democracies are failing, I think, not because of the usual explanation, populism, but because of a much more institutional explanation and that is the state of political parties. So let's start. So, you know, how do democracies die? So what's really striking is that 
democracies don't die as much as they used to by coup. So this is a map that shows you, this is sort of the number of coups in any given year. The, the gray shaded area is the Cold War when there were a lot of proxy fights between the Soviet Union and the US, which were resulting in coups all over the place. We don't have to say this as loudly in Latin America as you might in other parts of the world. Um, and what's striking is that much of the, the number of coups goes down. We get to the end of the Cold War and the number of coups really drops, even though, and I, I put this little chart up here, even though the number of countries is going up, right? So the, the slide is even more dramatic if you measure it in number of coups per country, right? Um, and so coups just aren't the way democracies are changing anymore. Um, so how do democracies die? Well, this is a, a chart from an article um, by Anna Lerman and Stefan Lindbergh, who are part of the VDEM uh, family. And this is an article that looks at sort of great leaps in the power of executives. And they so that sort of underlying count is of consolidations of executive power. And in the period before the Second World War, overwhelmingly, these were Black illegal access to power. So who's breaking the law in various ways, in very overt ways, uh, and then major extensions to law. In this coup period that we saw on the prior chart, what you see are a lot of illegal transformations of executive power. And then with the end of the Cold War, this really shifts. And so this light blue bar gets much bigger. This is the what measures, which are this measures what they call legal access to power, which is to say executives enlarge their power without formally changing the law. And it looks like it's within the law. There's minor extensions and there's some major extensions, but overwhelmingly since the end of the Cold War measured worldwide in this VDEM data, these major extensions of executive power are done legally in some way or other, right? So that's the phenomenon that we need to explain. So as we think about putting these pieces together, you know, constitutional democracy <laughs> uh, looks like it's on the ropes, like we're seeing lots of backward sliding democracies, but here's what's interesting. So first of all, like when we go back, actually, I'll just, you know, so if we go back two slides, uh, whoops, how do I do that? I go back two slides um, to this one. What's happening at the top of this scale, like the countries that were in the top half in 2009, are overwhelmingly going down, right? The improvers tend to be tend to have been, you know, worse off uh, in the uh, in the in 2009 and earlier. So it was seen sliding at the top, right? Um, and when that happens, what it means is that it's the so-called consolidated democracies. What what uh, political scientists define as consolidated democracies, which they used to describe as a system in which democracy is quote the only game in town. Right, where it becomes unthinkable to have anything else. But it's those countries that are the ones that we see that are backsliding perhaps the most. And what's interesting is that these democracies are failing, not, not in, they fail only in reality, but not in theory. So what we're seeing is a lot of autocrats that come to power and they say, we are, we are writing a new constitution. We are doing everything legally. They advertise the constitutionalization of what they're doing or the constitutionality of what they're doing, which is to say that even if they're undermining democracy, constitutional democracy in all the ways that we can measure in these kinds of democracy rating scales, they're not denying the normative, um, it's a normative bindingness or attractiveness of the model of constitutional democracy as such, right? So these new autocrats by and large, don't want to appear to fail. They're not canceling elections. They're not overthrowing constitutions and replacing them with nothing. They're not mostly doing simply illegal things. So what we're seeing is the rise of what I call legalistic autocrats, right, who create this veneer of legality while they're simultaneously removing checks on executive power. But you have to know a fair amount of constitutional law to see what they're doing in a lot of these cases. So again, constitutional democracy is still an attractive ideal. So if that's what's happening, then the question is, you know, who is to blame? <laughs> and I think there are broadly speaking, two kinds of explanations out there sort of in the, among academics. One is the, the big explanation, which is populism, right? Which is the people have gone crazy. 
voters are electing these folks, voters are cheering them on, the voters show up at rallies, voters have given up on you know, robust constitutional democracy and they would prefer like a strong man running the show, right? That's the standard explanation. But what I'm gonna try to convince you of today is that there's another kind of um, answer that we could have. And that is that there's a failure in political systems, right? There's a failure of institutions that's leading to this, not so much a failure of the people. So how am I gonna argue that? Well, so the usual arguments, and I'm sure you've seen these kinds of arguments all the time, is that people are making dangerous choices at election time. And that's because they've been left behind economically, they're swimming in fake news, right? They're, they're afraid of immigrants or terrorism, threats to identity or you know, the old world disappearing. They're angry at old elites. They are, you know, racist or something, right? So there's been this massive people blaming thing that's been going on in the literature on populism. But I don't actually think that that, that is what's primarily driving this democratic decline. So the people may, if you poll them, they may support all kinds of populist things like, no, we don't want any immigrants around here. No, we don't want anybody different from us. Um, you know, all the cosmopolitans should be taken out and hanged. You know, like there's a lot of bad attitudes out there, right? But when you ask people in the very same surveys, do you still want to have like a constitutional democratic government? They score pretty high on constitutional democratic values, even while they're being populist. So let me just give you, I have a lot more opinion data. This is a reasonably short talk. So let me just give you this one piece. This is from 2017. Um, it's the Pew Global Research Survey, which they do annually. And this is where they asked questions in these target countries that year, you know, would a system in which a strong leader can make decisions without interference from parliament or the courts be a good or a bad way of governing this country, right? Pure play for like, do you approve of autocracy? And what's striking is that, you know, even in the countries that you would think had taken this giant lurch toward populism, that's explaining the crash of constitutional democracy, you don't find workable electoral majorities anywhere close, right, to supporting that view. So this is the year after Trump is elected, you know, in the US, the US has 22%, which is kind of an alarming number, but it won't sway elections by itself. Hungary and Poland, you know, two of the countries that are, you know, way far down the line on constitutional destruction, have, have you know, certainly it, it not, not much worse than the US and maybe better. Uh, so, you know, it turns out that the countries that have relatively small populist movements also have relatively smaller numbers, but we're not talking about overwhelming election changing support for autocracy in the same years that populism is supposed to be flourishing, right? So this is, it's, it's a bunch of surveys that show this kind of thing that make me think that populism is really not the best explanation for what's going on. So populism, I think, over explains. Um, and experts will call publics populist after the election brings a populist, as they're called, to power. But I think we need to back up and ask, you know, what's happening at those, at, during those elections? Um, what did voters know when they voted? What were the choices they had? And did they really intend <laughs> everything that happened afterwards, right? Because the fact that somebody, I mean, I'm sure we've all had the experience, right? Of voting for somebody who then did something that we would never have approved, right? So I'm just thinking that may be more common in these kinds of situations than we give it credit for. So elections, if we're gonna focus on the pivotal elections that bring autocrats to power, we have to say, you know, what were voters choosing from? And then what produces those choices? And were there good choices that voters bypassed in voting for the populist slash autocrat? Or did voters do what voters should do in a well-functioning constitutional democracy and something else failed, right? So the question is, are voters really voting to crash their constitutions or are they voting for something else? So what should voters do? Well, you know, one thing that you would expect to happen in a healthy democracy is that periodically, government should be thrown out, right? A, a president for life is usually a bad sign, even if they're repeatedly elected. So you sort of want in a democracy turnover of parties. So if one party has been in place for a long time, it might be supportive of democracy 
to swap them out for somebody else at the next election, right? Um, but also if voters get a really clear signal that somebody is toxic, then maybe they shouldn't vote for that candidate, right? So the question is, what do voters know at the time that they're voting? Now, I'm just gonna go really quickly through two countries that I think sort of exemplify this, one that sort of a lurch to the left and one that lurched to the right. And both Hungary and Venezuela were at least over the, the, the couple of several decades before they voted for an autocrat, <laughs> were considered sort of models in their regions, right? So Hungary was kind of one of the star countries that came out of the post-1989 transition, just as Venezuela had come out of the post-1958 transition and had been reasonably stable since that time. Both democracies were, for much of their history before the autocrat came to power, robust democracies of multiple parties. But in the decade before the pivotal election where the autocrat came to power, the country had settled into what's called by political scientists a two-party punishing vote pattern, right? Where one party wins, like if you, they, so first of all, the multiple parties had sort of formed in two blocks. So that's the first thing, the, the, the restriction on the number of parties. The second thing is that voters had been voting first for one party, then for the other party, then for the other party, then for the other party. So at each election, they were punishing the party that had won the last time. And you see this kind of seesawing back and forth. And then what started to happen was that parties started to fall apart. But they did this. So sometimes these parties fall apart for internal reasons. I think in both Venezuela and in Hungary, what happened was that the left party had come to power and um, there had been an economic collapse on the watch of the left party. And then the, um, the IMF had swooped in, said, okay, we'll bail you out conditional on your adopting an austerity program. And first of all, these austerity programs, which usually demand cutting social welfare um, programs of all kinds, run completely counter to whatever it is the left had run on. Right. And it's interesting that in both Venezuela um, and in, in Hungary, this, these austerity programs um, came in um, you know, at the time that a left party was in power and forced that government to work opposite its, its party platform, so to speak. Um, and so um, anyway, so this is one of the dilemmas. So in some sense, right before the autocrats come to power, there's an externally imposed austerity program happens in both of these places. And so by the time you get to 1998 in Venezuela and 2010 in Hungary, it's almost like there's nobody else to vote for because you're not gonna vote for the party that just crashed things. And then the question is who else is there? And so just to focus in a little bit on, on Hungary, you know, when Viktor Orban came to power in 2010, it's important to remember that he had been prime minister once before and he was conservative, but the country survived. Of course, he'd been in coalition before and many voters thought he would have to go into coalition again. He's just squeaked over the line into you know, having a government that did not require any other party to change the constitution. But if you look at Orban's campaign from 2010, it was a very conventional campaign. He's campaigning against austerity. He's campaigning against corruption. He never once said during the election campaign that he would rewrite the constitution. And the other parties, the Liberal Party had collapsed, the socialists, well, they had just bankrupted the country. There was a little tiny, um, I always call them vaguely left, vaguely liberal, but mostly vague little Green Party that sort of nobody knew that was young people that had never been involved in politics before. And then there were the neo-Nazis. I was just relieved when the election happened that the neo-Nazis didn't win, right? Orban was the moderate in that pool and he didn't look that dangerous unless you knew him well. Um, and at the time, if you look at opinion data, this is in 2010, the Pew Global Attitude Survey. If you ask like, how satisfied are you with democracy? Hungarians were really fed up, right? And they should be. Everything had been terrible. Like what sane person, I'm wondering who the people are who said they were satisfied, right? Because things were really a mess. But in that same survey, Hungarians were asked about their support for democratic values and on fair judiciary, multi-party elections, free media, on all this stuff, the sort of the median score put Hungary at the top in the region on support for constitutional and democratic values, right? In the same survey. So that's why I'm saying that a vote for Orban was not necessarily a vote to crash the constitution. 
And let me just say something quickly about Venezuela, because if you look at Chavez's campaign in 1998, he's also campaigning against, against austerity. He's campaigning to get out from under austerity programs in general. He's in favor of redistribution, as you know, which was very popular. He campaigned against corruption. He did not say he would rewrite the constitution. Some of you may know better. I'm getting all of this from you know, translated speeches. So if you know of, of a speech where he promised everything he did, let me know. But mostly the question was, do you stay the course under the president who presided over the economic collapse or do you vote for this guy? And remember, the number of parties in Venezuela by this time had been limited, so the choices were actually limited. And that's why I'm wondering if voters really voted populist in this election, or whether they were simply voting for, quote, the other guy when the people currently in power had been discredited. So I'm wondering whether voters really could tell what was coming. You know, they were voting against incumbents in both cases. The autocrats didn't campaign as autocrats. There weren't very many other choices. And voters may well have legitimately believed that, you know, an elected government should be given a chance to govern. Let's try the other guys, right? Which is what you do in a democracy, rotating power. So I'm not so, not so, so the populist explanation is voters wanted what they got. And I'm not sure they wanted what they got. So what's happening? So I think what's happening is a failure of political parties. Because when you look at, so what's the institutional structure that holds up these election choices? The parties had often been torn apart before you get to these crucial elections. So in Hungary and Venezuela, the party, the incumbent parties were discredited. The new parties that came along, and Orban was not a new party. So here in Orban's case, you have a, a party that had been there from the beginning of the democratic changes coming back. And people who knew Orban knew a little bit, knew that he could be dangerous. But his public presentation had, was not nearly as dangerous as he became. Chavez, yes, Chavez had led an attempted military coup. That should have been a danger signal, right? On the other hand, in that election, who were you going to vote for? Right. So I'm just saying, put yourselves in the shoes of the voters with the campaign that they got and ask whether they could have reasonably guessed that they were going to get what they got. Um, with Brexit, with the US Trump elections here too, you've got conservative parties that are ripped apart, that put forward unpalatable choices, but it's because the party itself is in trouble. And so what I'm trying to argue here is that the collapse of parties or, or malfunctions in the party system precede these crucial elections at which the, the autocrats come to power. And this is where I really want to find out more about Brazil from all of you. But here's the question. This is happening not just in one or two countries. This is happening almost everywhere, right? Almost everywhere that autocrats are coming to power. I think you can, you can see that the, there's sort of these unvetted candidates coming through a broken party system and voters vote for them because they're voting for the other guy, you know, at the time of the election. So what's happening to parties? Like, why is this happening in so many parts of the world at once? And so my argument is that you can get rogue leaders without rogue voters. And that's because what looks like a normal election can bring abnormal results if the party system is broken. So what can go wrong? And I can spend more time on these slides. They're sort of detailed, but let me just hit the highlights here. So what happens with parties? So one thing that happens is that parties keep recycling the same old people and voters get sick of them. So they vote for like the new person, like who has not yet had a chance. And the question is, why do exhausted parties keep putting up the same people? My husband who moved uh, to the US from, uh, from Russia kept saying, are there more than Clintons and Bushes in American politics? I thought you guys had party competition, right? So, and you sort of see this, uh, like when Macron came, it was being you know, up for election without a party, by the way, you know, all the traditional parties were like marginalized. Macron comes in as the new guy because they're running all the same people. Like these were all familiar faces. And you could say the same about five stars in Italy and so on, but sometimes what voters are doing is just voting for something new, right? There's also parties that are just being ripped apart. And I think the Tory party in the UK and the Republican party in the US have had this civil war going on between different factions. And when you have civil war in a party, sometimes the sort of the rogue faction can win or they wind up making, like in the case of Brexit, um, David Cameron didn't really want to take the UK out of the, out of the EU, but he was sort of forced by his party to kind of put this up as a platform 
And when they won bigger than they imagined they would, suddenly he had to do it, right? And so what you get are these kind of parties that have civil wars and they put to the public in a sense, a referendum on their own internal civil war, you know, and that can result in unpalatable or anti-democratic or problematic choices being put to voters. Parties can sometimes drift. So the Fidesz party in Hungary, for example, had been a, had been a libertarian party. Then it was a mainstream conservative party. Then it became an autocratic radical party. And the same party kept shifting with the same leadership. So if you weren't paying close attention, you might not have realized. In Poland, when the Peace Party came to power, they'd been in power before and they'd been roundly elected, uh, rejected. And in the election where they came back, what they said was, we will be different this time. And they and this Jaroslav Kaczynski, who was head of the party, was in the background, right? He was not the presidential candidate. He was not the prime ministerial candidate. He's just an ordinary MP. And they said, and we promise we will not make this controversial guy our defense minister, which then they did. But still, in the election campaign, they're saying, we know you didn't like us last time and we will fix this, right? So sometimes you have parties that either go bad when they used to be normal or parties that pretend to be better than they are, but the election campaign is misleading, you know, either way. And so that's another thing that happens. Um, and this is something where I think, and I'm wondering whether this isn't a lot the, the, um, a lot the case uh, in Brazil and in Latin America more generally, that one of the things we're seeing is that some mainstream parties are brought down, or some mainstream parties are brought down by austerity programs. That when countries go bankrupt, the, you know, the, until recently, the IMF has come in and insisted on a sort of anti-left, you know, neoliberal program, which then discredits the parties on whose watch they came in and causes all the other parties to, to react sort of against this. So this external neoliberal sort of forces. But it could also be, I think, that the old left-right spectrum that underwrites the party system in most um, advanced democracies is based on an idea of a left defending a working class and redistribution and a right defending property rights and the managerial class. And if your country is enmeshed in a global economy, it's not so clear to me that either of those things can be done on a purely national scale, which is to say room for maneuver of national governments is being very, very sharply lifted, um, restricted by being embedded in a global economy that has made economic issues harder to actually show that you've achieved anything on because they're not in your, this one country's control. So this makes me wonder, you know, if you see parties all over the world um, falling apart, like what is actually happening and I think that this old left-right political spectrum turns out not to be where most parties are actually aligning themselves. And a lot of it is because national economic issues have ceased to be as prominent in these campaigns. And what you're seeing are symbolic issues, social issues, um, you know, external enemy type issues. What you're seeing is a rejection of the old left-right division of labor, so to speak, between parties, um, and that within parties of the left and parties of the right, you're seeing a fight between the, the what I call the nationalists and the cosmopolitans, right? The people who think we ought to retreat more into our national space and give up globalization, you know, de detach from all of those international ties because what's local and familiar is better versus the people who say, Let's dig in on globalization, universal values, trying to, to trying to live up to a cosmopolitan ideal. And that's increasingly the axis of politics. And when left-right parties have to make an adjustment to this new world in which nationalism and cosmopolitanism are the, the kind of ends of the ideological spectrum, what you're getting is, well, this is, this is the Pippa Norris, Ron Englehart view of things, which is they think both dimensions are happening at once, that you have a left-right economic, a left-right sort of political spectrum, and then a popular, what they call populism to cosmopolitanism, or what I would call nationalism to cosmopolitanism spectrum. And they think that parties kind of position themselves in this two-dimensional space. But I think what's happening is that the, the up-down continuum on this chart is actually disrupting and dividing the left-right spectrum on this chart.
right? Which is that parties of the left are being torn apart on this dimension. Parties of the right are being torn apart on this dimension. And when that happens, you get this weakening of parties from within. And that that thing is happening the world over precisely because the increasing interdependence of the global economy means that traditional parties are losing their appeal because countries by themselves can't fundamentally change this economic organization. In other words, globalization has outgrown the ability of national governments to do much about it. And so national parties are realizing that they can't compete on getting rid of free trade or getting rid of global interdependencies. So it's far better if we fight about things like what the flag should be, right? Or, you know, in the US social issues like gun control and abortion, those can be controlled within national borders and the political campaigns shift to those things. But in the course of doing that, they tear apart the parties that used to be organized differently. So my bottom line here is to say that when autocracy comes by means of elections, which is how it's happening these days, it comes because the party system in these places is the first casualty. So in other words, I think this has predictive power. So if you look at countries that are still okay, more like France, you know, where their party system is really in trouble, I would be really worried there because it's the, it's the weakening of the party system that precedes this stuff. And so parties that fail to respond coherently to this, you know, really run the risk of becoming irrelevant or becoming riven or whatever. Um, and this is what is causing the weaknesses. And so what you see in these pivotal elections when autocrats come to power is that voters are often doing exactly what they should be doing. Like the other guys were in power the last eight years, let's have somebody new, right? Or we've, had, we've given all those parties a chance. All of them have failed, let's try somebody new, right? Or the last time these guys were in power, it wasn't so bad, so we'll go back to them, you know? But a lot of these things are changes that, are, that make sense to the voters, but that don't make sense if the parties aren't vetting candidates for being responsible constitutional Democrats. So this is why I want to say, if you omit, if you, if you simply look at the, at, at you think you're facing a sea of angry voters voting to crash constitutional democracy, I think that's really not what's going on here. I think voters are doing the best in a bad situation. And what we really need to do is think about the bad situation. So I'll end just really quickly here because I'm still developing all of this. So then what do we do, right? So the first thing we have to do is kind of constitution proof it's, you know, some of these systems so that they're less easily taken over by the, by the legalistic autocrats when they come to power. And so we have this concept in the literature of militant democracy. I'm thinking we need a concept like militant legality, which is not just to make this a positivist legality kind of thing, but we know that part of what we need to protect in order to keep a democracy intact are a number of independent institutions that act as the referees and the guardrails, right? Like an independent judiciary, independent media, civil sector, and electoral machinery, that we need to strengthen those things in advance of some of these assaults that are coming, right? So that's, I think, the, the first kind of thing. But the second thing is that I'm always surprised by how few constitutions regulate political parties. You know, in the US, political parties are sort of private institutions, you know only a little bit regulated. I put up the German basic law because the German basic law is one of the very few constitutions that regulates political parties. And what everybody notes about the German constitution is this part two of article 21, which is that it's possible for the constitutional court to, um, to um, uh, you know, abolish uh, anti-constitutional parties. But what people don't spend enough on is article one, right? which is that political parties, when they say they shall participate in the formation of the political will, it means that they're in integral parts of a constitutional system. And while they may be freely established, their internal organization must conform to democratic principles. I don't think this alone does it, but in almost all the autocratic parties or the, the parties headed by autocrats, often democratic rotation was killed off in the party before it was killed off in the country. Right, so that one thing to do might be to look at democratic principles and then this public accountability, transparency about party organization may be something that we might wanna think about. Um, but I think we need to focus on parties as crucial to a democracy, um, but also something that has such public impact that we should think about some kind of constitutional regulation. And then finally, you know, I'm, I'm struck by how many people learn very quickly 
how much they care about constitutional democracy once it's gone. <laughs> but they didn't know they cared about it so much before it happened, right? And so thinking about how we engage in public education so that people see the dangers coming before they, they come, we need to make people even better voters <laughs> to think about you know, exactly how are these candidates making these appeals and trying to get people to pay attention to the fact that danger is lurking ahead. And it's not just because somebody's on, you know, the fact that somebody appears on a ballot is no guarantee that they won't try to crash the entire system that allowed them to get onto the ballot. And so that's why I wanna say, I think this is not the end. I'm hoping this uh, gives us a possibility of moving forward a bit. Um, and I look forward to all of your comments and I particularly look forward to actually seeing whether you think this is what happened in Brazil. So thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Chappelle. Uh, it is always a great pleasure uh, to hear from you. And uh, every time that I see you, I, 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 it is a, a great surprise because you do those wonderful presentations and that uh, was another opportunity for all of us to learn from it again. Uh, before we start debating with the participants of this uh, event today, let's hear from Professor uh, Desiree Salgado. She will be the discussant of this text that was just presented by Professor Chappelle. Uh, so again, thank you, Professor Chappelle, and thank you, Professor Desiree Salgado. Desiree, please. Thank you, Emilio. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to participate in this UFMG seminar, and even more to have the space for dialogue with Professor King Lane Chappelle. Professor, it's kind of a fan moment right now, so maybe I'm a little bit nervous about it. The part is over just one of the texts and provocations that this extraordinary scholar has presented to public debate. So thank you very much for your text. I thank Emilio for the invitation and even more for the theme. I have been concerned about the role of political parties in democracy for some time. And I also dedicate myself to analyzing the role of democracy inside political parties, here with a view to the Brazilian set scenario. Professor Chappelle started the paper by questioning the blame on people in our eroded democracies. Professor, I must say, I'm not willing to take people off the hook. I'm not sure that we cannot blame the people a little bit, but I have to say that I'm talking from Brazil and you all know what our president and our government is doing right now. My intention is to present a view from an objective approach, but I'm living in Brazil. And uh, as all you know, our government, our political system, our political party system, and everything around here is a little bit mess. We also want to figure out what's going on here and what you can do to improve the system. So forgive me, I'm immersed in a very problematic context and it can blur my analysis. I cannot stay, be away from this very particular moment. I'm also considered the political constitutional design elements, the electoral system, political parts regulation, and electoral behavior. And to perform, to perform the role I'm supposed to do, I will highlight some part of the text. We clearly, we clearly see here the pointed credibility collapse of the political parties. I built um, intraparty democratic index analyzing the manifestos and programs of Brazilian political parties. And if the index could, could go from zero to one, and just one of the 35 political parties was with a, presented a, a, performer, a performance more than a half of this index. So we don't have uh, no, a very weak, we have here a very weak commitment on democratic, actions and functioning in Brazilian political parties. So I'm not sure about the, the that, that you can have this regulated in a very strong way, but I will share that with, with you. 
I'm not sure also about this insidious in fight ideological drift, the civil war inside the parties. Not at least, Professor, in a multi party system where it's relatively easy to create a new party. So if you have this civil war, this very strong fight inside the party, it's easy for a group to form a new party here in Brazil. It's, it's, it's true here because of our regulation of political party and also because of the proportional, proportional represent, represent, sorry, proportional represent RP political system. So it's it's more it's it's easier to a party to survive here without a very strong popular approach or popular support because of the proportional representation system. I'm not sure that we, if we can identify here and in Latin America the division between cosmopolitan globalists versus nationalists and localists. I have this, this impression with the, the work from Rochelle Dalton that the big cleavage here is, is related to post-materialist issues. So we have the division inside the parties also, more about gender and LGBT rights and uh, things like that, more than the, the, the role of internal economic decisions but maybe an impression of the, the, the way we are working on our divisions right here. We have some progressive parts inside the political parties that are going against the old leaders because of that. I'm not sure that the cosmopolitan and the nationalist think can, can be an explanation for our problem here. And I'm pretty sure it can be expanded for all Latin American countries. We have a grammatic of nationalism, nationalism, but it's very tricky to say because, because our nationalist leaders used to have the US flag in their profile or in the, the Twitter accounts. So it's a kind of a little bit strange nationalism. Maybe they want to mirror the, the way nationalism is, is built in US, but I'm not sure if that's the, the, the main problem. Maybe it's more about a conservative worldview and a more progressive one. Even inside progressive and conservatives, political parties. I have, I see also some problems from a Latin American perspective. I know we have a significant lack of inter-party democracy, accountability and transparency. But who will be the guardian of the constitutional and democratic commitment of the political parties? I know I'm talking from Brazil. And we had this very peculiar event called car wash operation. And the, the effects of judicial decisions on the electoral context in 2018. So it's very hard to me to say that the judicial branch would be a very good bet in this case. And we can also bet in the electoral authority. In Brazil, the electoral authority is also, is, is also in the judicial branch. And this almighty electoral authority do everything. They do the electoral administration and also the electoral, the electoral adjudication. They are the same authority who shares components, integrants, members with the Supreme Court. So it's very hard to me also to put a, 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 a my faith in the electoral committee or board. They are not partisan, but they are not also 
kind of restricted by a very good checks and balance system. They kind of have a protection from the Supreme Court because they share some members. So I, I have this problem with the, this answer here. And when we are talking about the existence of political parties, we have a slight analysis of the programs in the registration at the electoral authority. After the registration, the electoral court can cancel this party or ban or, or make the party disappear only in a specific cases. Use of foreign money, subordination to foreign entity or government, lack of submission of party accounting, and paramilitary organization. So we don't have constitutional permission to trigger militant democracy. Electoral authority can refuse registration, but cannot ban or dissolve political parties on democratic issues. In case we change the rule, we can change that. We are very good in changing constitutional rules and uh, political parties and electoral rules. But what institution would perform as political party policy? No partisan constitutional institution should we bet on a full, or more even, full judici judicialization of the party's functioning and banning? Can we, Brazilian, trust the courts to make the right call to be ideological neutral? We had more not for, for, from 2018, but from our history, we had the experience of the Communist Party banning twice under previ previous constitutions. The reasoning was allegedly based on a concept of militant democracy on both sides because it was a split decision. And the this, this decision was frankly biased. It was an ideological decision. The second problem, the citizenry, and that I think I can, I can talk not from just from Brazil, but all Latin America, seems not to be committed to constitutional democratic values. The numbers professor will show us about Hungary, Poland, US, UK are very different here in Brazil. We have more, uh, I think it's 34% of support of the democratic regime. For a lot of people, it doesn't matter if we have a democratic or an autocratic regime. And 14% say they prefer an autocratic regime. So it's, it's very different, the scenario of the support of democracy. And then I, 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 I dare to ask you, do parties should be, should be or should do better than society? Should they be more embodied with democratic beliefs and practices? If we don't have a democratic society, why should we have democratic parties? Third problem, the, the region's constitutions give political parties an important role in democracy but also assure them autonomy. It was very important in Brazilian history because of the dictatorship just before our present constitution. Political parties are not public entities. So how to impose a regulation without transforming them into state organizations? How to avoid external capture by economic power or authoritarian groups and at the same time, guarantee political freedom. Going now to the approach on Venezuela and Hungary, I'm not sure about the justification of the people's electoral choice. In your text, you pointed out that there were wordings of the autocratic tendencies of Victor Urban. We can say the same thing in the Brazilian case. The parliamentary history of the president is plenty of authoritarian discourses and practices. The moment of the impeachment of the president himself was emblematic in this case. 
he was offering his vote to a very recognized part. Um, I, I'm not even can. It's very hard to even say that. But it was uh, an an omen. He was honoring a torture guy, a guy who was responsible for torture, even torturing the president. So it's, it's very hard for me to believe that there were no warnings about the candidates. And more, the manifesto of President of uh, Bolsonaro was frankly, frankly, anti-pluralistic. It was writing, it was written down. It's not a, oh, maybe it's not what, a, no, it's the, in the, in the meetings, he even used the word to exterminate the adversaries, the enemies. So it's very hard to me to say we cannot blame people in Brazilian case in 2018 elections. Liberal democracy demands vigilant and committed citizens, people willing to be public virtuals to keep the bastards honest. Populism appears as a shortcut, a way to transfer the responsibility, the responsibility, the Republican duties. I agree, Professor, that politics has failed the people. But political parties are not suicidal. The alternatives they present to the citizenry take into account electoral strategies. If they serve destructive options, maybe they are reading the public opinion. I claim the political parties should be some kind of constitutional and democratic attached filter of candidacies, but maybe the electorate is not connected to democratic values. And I use the, the, the index of Latino barometer, Latino barometer to say that the service that was applied in 2018, the last time, the last time. and the, the set of surveys shows a very strong decline in democratic support. Taking in mind the 2018 Brazilian elections, it's possible to claim people failed politics, or at least democratic politics. We had other options. Main, and it's, it's true, mostly in the first, I don't know how to say it, help me, Emilio. I know that the second turn that we call this is balotage, but I don't know how to say the first one. Here we demand, we demand majority, not only plurality, to the electoral choice of the, the electorate. So in the first, first occasion of, of electoral choice, we had plenty of alternatives. Yes, it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Can yeah, I explain myself in English? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The first round of election and the, the second first round. round. Yes, yeah. we had a lot of options. Not all nice, <laughs> I must confess. But some of them were plausible. It was, it was okay. It was nice options. And in the second round, the ballotage, then we have this Pivoto, it's the, the I, I used to call that sometimes the alien versus predator choice of the electorate. That no matter who wins, you will lose, because sometimes you have very bad alternatives in the ballotage. But before thinking about how to, to put a more a harder control on political parties, we should think about how to accentuate widespread commitment to democracy. We had some democratic possibilities in the first round. It's worth highlighting that political parties should offer a holistic manifesto or proposal, proposals 
when in electoral disputes. And it is always complicated in divided societies with sharp cleavages. I think it's very hard here in Brazil. It's not only an ideological, ideological problem of separation and vision, but also cla um, classist and economic, and uh, even about religious beliefs. <laughs> it's all dividing us right now. But Professor, I, I must confess that I, that I cannot agree more with the conclusion. Political parties are crucial to the sustaining and pre preservation of democracy. And they must be democratic entities. Right now I'm trying to convince some, some representatives to present a, a, um, a law on intra-party democracy because I think it's very important to regulate that. But how to do that with not so democratic societies? How to support and improve the political parties in a society with a very weak commitment to constitutional democratic principles? And we have been fooled before with the discourse on against democracy and against everything like that. We, we fall for that in, in the 30s and again in the 60s, and now again in the 2018 elections. So I'm not sure that I can say, people, uh, you're not to blame on. You, you, you did what was possible in that time. I, I maybe I'm more, I'm harder to the people's choices. I don't know if I, I could bring some interesting or some provocations, but it was a, a very important text to me to think about that, to say, okay, it's a problem, but how can we fix that? How I said, I'm not sure about the idea of militant democracy, but maybe the idea of militant legality should be more attractive to us. Um, I'm not so sure about the battle independent judiciary because we are just traumatized by that. And also about the independent media because we have this problem of fake news and misinformation and disinformation, all that. About the independent civic sector, we have this problem with a weak commitment to democracy to democracy with the society and the electoral machine, we have to change our, our constitutional design of electoral authority to be able to bet on that. So thank you again, Emilio, for giving me the time, the floor to discuss such a wonderful paper and a superb presentation that raised so many questions. It's a privilege to be here, think aloud with you all. And Professor, you are fantastic. You have here a very big fan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you so much. Your comments were really interesting and important for problematizing, discussing uh, Professor Kim's proposals. Maybe uh, we should do like this. Professor Kim, uh, you could present some answers to uh, uh, Aneda's uh, uh, comments. And then after that, we open the, the session for the Q&A. We have a, a very qualified audience here today. Professor Mark, Mark Tushet uh, joined us today. Professor Thomas Bustamante, Professor uh, Juliano Benvindo, and several other researchers here. Uh, could we, we, we do like, th like this, uh, Professor Kim? So some minutes for you to comment on yeah, that's fine. I don't want to take a lot of time because I'm interested in hearing what other people have to say. And I really, those were fabulous comments and thank you so much. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think what you've, what you've identified are all the reasons why this is difficult because, and it may differ in, in different political systems where you want to lodge the power to oversee the political process because it has to be a piece of the 
system that isn't itself politicized. And if the courts are already knee deep in all of these political disputes, perhaps because of how they've been appointed, perhaps, you know, because of their internal operating rules, you know, or whatever, then that that's not the place, right? So the question is, you know, is there is there some place that that where the supervision of elections can be located that is, you know, um, insulated from direct political influence. So, you know, it happens to be courts in some places, but not every place. And so election commissions might be able to work. Um, you know, I think there are all kinds of ways we could think about how to do that, but I think there has to be, there has to be something, right? So the question is, and this is where I was so fascinated where you were saying that, um, it's I, I mentioned parties, but of course it's the electoral rules in general, right? So PR systems are really great if you have a lot of parties. It keeps it prevents a concentration usually, and it it requires a kind of dialogue among parties. But presidential systems in the end wind up often being runoffs, you know, like in France, like in Brazil, you know, sort of runoffs between two candidates. Uh, and then all that diversity that you might get in, in PR representation in the parliament disappears in a presidential system, right? So I think that we have to, you know, give broader thought to how the election rules are, are organized um, and go back to that old debate about whether presidentialism is always a problem, um, you know, exactly for these kinds of, kinds of reasons. But I, I want to take on your, I think that your biggest challenge, which is that, you know, maybe some, de maybe some populations aren't up to it you know, like they're not ready for democracy. And I must say, I hear this almost everywhere. I mean, including in the US, which, you know, has had a fair amount of practice at running a flawed democracy, you know, without, I mean, had, I was gonna say, without having tipped off into, no, we've tipped several times into really dangerous territory. And, and so the, if, you, if there's a population that's not ready for democracy, that's also a democratic problem, right? And it's something that, we have to change the you know educational systems. We have to change the way we think about involving people in democracy. Maybe you know. And so I think that's a bigger project about how to get people on board. What we very often find is that the audience for these so-called populist candidates are what the political scientists call low information voters. You know. So I remember when Bolsonaro made that comment about torture, right? And it's like, oh my God, how could you vote for him? Certainly, Donald Trump made a lot of comments that were similarly alarming, right? And what's interesting is that many of the voters who vote for these people don't know about that stuff because they weren't paying attention. Like everyone on this call is gonna be paying attention because that's what we do, right? But most people pay very little attention and their lives are overwhelming and they, you know, they go to vote and here's a new face. And, you know, so in other words, maybe we need to think about how to get people to pay more attention, right? Um, and they're paying attention to the fake news, like how can we make actual elections more like fake news, right? So I think these are all kind of challenges of organization of, of elections. But there's also, and at least, you know, people ask me this about Trump all the time, like how did the US vote for Trump? Like not just once, but you know, he came close the second time. And here's where, you know, there may not be one explanation, but there may be a bunch of them. And, and so the thing about, you know, presidents who say bad things and when they're running or when they're in office and Bolsonaro, you know, looks like he's safely behind in, ne in the election next year, but, you know, he still has supporters. Um, so there are a lot of people who say, oh, well, he says, he says crude stuff, but, you know, somebody has to get things done, right? So there's this kind of rhetoric is one thing, action is something else, and they discount the rhetoric. They discount, you know, big swaths of the American electorate were discounting Trump's racism, for example. So there's another question here, not just about what voters support, but what they're willing to forgive too easily. And so the question about creating democratic voters also goes to this question about what you're willing to tolerate, you know? And so, um, so I think that there's a public education component that's, that's absolutely crucial. But there's also, there's, so there's election rules. So when you have a lot of, you know, attract a lot of parties in round one, many of which are embarrassing and some of which are fine. And, and then you wind up with a second round in which like, eh, you know, um, maybe there are too many parties, right? So there's, there's a question about how many parties can voters actually pay attention to, you know? So again, it's a system design question about what's the, 
optimal number of parties given your election system. So again, it's some of that I think is engineerable at least, or that we can do better than we do at thinking about those interrelations. Um, but some of them are just a, you know, there's a, there's a political culture issue as well. So I, all I'm doing is multiplying the variables here, right? But still saying that, that I think that when we get to these elections of autocrats, so I would be really interested to see the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the Latin barometer kind of, you know, data. I've been trying to look at that actually, because it looks to me, at least on first pass, kind of like the European data that I look at, which is when you say people are anti-democratic, often it means they're, they're anti-pluralist. They don't mind a president who says he's going to torture. I mean, all that stuff is terrible, right? Like, cause we disagree with it politically, but that's different from saying there should be no checks on executive power. So, the, so those are the two things I want to separate, right? Like the bad attitudes <laughs> that shouldn't be policy that we should argue against in a democratic political space. And then the stuff about rules of the game, right? To separate the policy part from the rules of the game. And that's, that's where I think we can do better at strengthening people's commitments to rules of the game. Um, while simultaneously taking them on, you know, as opponents politically in the, in the, in the, in the, in the question of political debate. And for that, the hard question is, how do you separate the rules of the game from the bad politics? I mean, certainly torture, like ought to be a rule of the game and not just something you have a vote about, right? And that's where all the political contestation comes is where you draw the line between essentially the constitutional matters, which are rules of the game, but beyond ordinary majorities and stuff that gets decided in elections with ordinary majorities. So that's where I think we need to, as, as a field, kind of sharpen our sense of, of the distinction. So, um, and anyway, I don't wanna go on and on because I wanna hear what other people have to say. I hope that's at least a partial answer, but I really appreciated your comments and thank you for taking the time to think that through and explain some of the Brazilian context, which I really appreciate because I need to learn it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. Uh, so now we have uh, plenty of time for, for more questions from the audience. Uh, Professor Mark Tushnet just did one uh, at the chat. Uh, I don't know if he, he wants to do it uh, personally or shall I read it? There he is. Oh, I, oh, I, I can do it. So I basically agree with the, most of the argument, which is not always the case when we get together. Uh, <laughs> Two observations. One is that uh, given your analysis, I would think, and the citation of the Whig party is also sort of interesting, I'd expect that you'd be seeing eventually over time, a reorganization of the party system right. so that the left-right division would either be replaced by or supplemented by the cosmopolitan local distinction. And you know, you do the Norris Engelhart thing, you get four parties, that's hard in some systems, so you get internal coalitions. But the thought might be that, you know, we're we're um, we're in a very difficult transitional period that will, okay. you know, shake itself out at some point. That's the first point. Mm -hmm. Second point, and this is related to um, the uh, commenter's uh, point about Lavajado is um, in all the, you, you have these four remedies of independent judiciary and so on, but everywhere that these problems have occurred, those institutions were in place at the time the folks arose. Um, and either as in case of Lavajado, they contributed to the difficulty or, or they were insufficient to uh, forestall it. Um, and so it's not clear to me how you could tinker with those elements in a way to reliably uh, guard against this kind of problem. That's it. Yeah. If, can, should I take those on or should we take more questions? Yeah. No, no, no. We can do it directly. Uh, we, okay. we don't have many people here. So, yes, please. Right. Yeah, so so Mark, I think those are great comments. And I think you're absolutely right that the American political system is in transition. I mean, I, and I think many of these systems are in transition. And so the question is, 
um, or how to put it, transition is a dangerous time <laughs> because um, you don't get proper vetting of candidates because the parties aren't strong enough. You know, one reason why Trump came up in the US, I think, was there were plenty of choices in those Republican primaries that resulted in Trump. But the party, the Republican party was so weak that they would have six candidates competing for the middle of what had been the party platform. And they kind of canceled each other out and Trump kept winning these plurality victories. And the party wasn't strong enough to put one centrist candidate up against him, right? And so what, you know, I don't think Trump won, Trump won a majority anywhere um, actually in the primaries and yet he became the candidate because there were too many candidates, right? It goes to the too many parties can be just as bad as too few. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that what you see is that the party structures are too weak to filter candidates. Now, these transitional periods, like we're sort of, you know, it's strong it's enough to put one centrist candidate up against him, right? Oh yeah, I, right, to put one centrist candidate up against him. I didn't hear where that came from, but yeah, exactly. So that's the, that's the worry here that um, the parties aren't strong enough to put responsible candidates out front because, it can't just be voter selection. You need somebody who knows these people better, who you know, certifies that they are worthy of running a democracy without crashing it, right? It's like they need a driver's license to be able for running a democracy or driving a democracy before they can run. So, um, so the problem with these parties in transition is that um, the metaphor I always wanna come up with is the molting penguin. You know, when penguins change feathers, like, they stand around and they look miserable while they've got some old feathers and some new feathers. And they're very bad at defending themselves while that's going on. <laughs> I happen to know a lot about penguins, don't ask. Um, and so this is what's happening. So you have these parties that are neither one thing nor the other. They, they, they still have a left-right division. They sort of have this cosmopolitan nationalist division. And the party is constantly trying to appease all these different sides and that it creates factions, it splits parties. And, so while they're in transition to a system that may better represent where the voters are, that that's exactly why this is happening now. I think you're absolutely right. On the independent agency point, so you know, the, I see this issue because every time somebody is put in charge of regulating this, that somebody gets captured, right? So if the courts, if if you have if if you've installed into your federal Supreme Court also the election court as a subset of it. It will get captured. Of course, it will get captured. If you have an election commission where that's the only thing, of course, it will get captured. So one of the things that, that suggests is a kind of checks and balances approach to independent agencies, where you, you, you put multiple agencies in charge of it. One is a backstop for the other or something. Like I, don't, I haven't thought through exactly how you do this, right? But if you have an independent election commission that can sound the whistle, on the courts having gone over to something like, so you may, you may need to design a kind of multi-layered protection, which makes it hard to capture all at once. You know, now if a government stays in power for 10 years, it's gonna capture everything. You know, what you want is, is for all the institutions not to be capturable, at least in a single term of office of a auto, you know, sort of an autocratic government, right? Um, and so, and because one of the things I have another talk about this, that what we see with some autocrats, and I, I don't think this has happened yet in Brazil, but you, you can tell me, it happened in Hungary. Between Orban's um, first, uh, his was the second, but you know, the, the election in 2010 where he came to power and 2014, he completely changed the electoral system so that he couldn't lose. And every election, he kind of tops it up a bit and makes more changes to put the opposition farther off balance. Um, and so it's, it's not been a fair election ever since he came to power. So it may be, for example, that you can't change election rules, you know, un unless it's prospectively after the next election. Or, you know, like I, I think we just need to think about how you make this thing more tamper-proof. And Mark is right that any single institution put in charge of something is capturable, or it becomes unaccountable, right? It has it develops its own agenda and runs away with things. So I think that if we think if we think about how we contain power when it's in the primary constitutional institutions, you know, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the idea is you have them all checking each other. Then I think we need a parallel structure outside in which multiple um, independent institutions check each other, right? And that that may be the best that we can do.
Great. Uh, I think that Thomas wanted to do a question too. Th th uh, thank you, this... Emilio. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Yes, please, Thomas. So Thomas, then Jean Vito, uh, and I think that Juliano wants to do a question too. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kim, for the, the wonderful talk. It was was very enlightening. Uh, I would I was just trying to um, to pick on something that uh, Professor Eneida said in the in the response to to the to the talk, and I'm trying to figure out the specifics of what happened in Brazil because, in fact, Bolsonaro he promised a coup. He spent a lifetime promising a coup. And he, he promised uh, that he would send his opponents to the edge of the bay. It was like a military uh, camp where they buried the people who died in the hands of the uh, of torturers and dictatorship. He said, I'm going to send everyone there. I mean, he, he promised in a sense that he would kill. And he, uh, in, in the Sunday before the election, he just said uh, that uh, you can choose between exile or prison. And, and the people were cheering and, and voting for this enthusiastically. So how did it happen? I think that uh, it takes so much of hate to vote for this and to, to accept it. I, I wonder if Brazil isn't in a special position with regards to other countries because of what we had just uh, two years before, which was a fraudulent impeachment, an impeachment without high crimes. And to make that impeachment happen, it took a lot of illegality. And all institutions did not work. Uh, the House of Representatives did not work. The Senate did not work. The Supreme Court did not work. The court system did not work because they leaked uh, conversations between Lula and Dilma to influence, specifically aimed at, and this leakage was specifically aimed at interfering in the, in the, in the impeachment process. So there was this, this huge amount of illegality and the people just would not mind anymore about whatever possible uh, illegality that Bolsonaro could do because uh, they were facing with so much lack of respect and something that once the working said that an impeachment uh, process can be like an atomic bomb. And I think that it was the aftermath of the atomic bomb. And perhaps this is why we voted for Bolsonaro. I would like to hear your views about that. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so let's collect uh, uh, Juliano and uh, Jean Vito, and then uh, Professor Kim can respond, the three of it. Juliano, please. Hi, hi, everyone. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, hi, Kim, um, and hi, everyone. That's just a, a, a very fast question. And I just want to add uh, uh, something that I, I've been writing about, is that Maybe some of our dysfunctionalities might work uh, in another way. In other way, I just uh, kind of thinking about two concepts uh, that apply here to Brazil. The first one is fragmentation, uh, because Brazil has a very, you know, one of the highest uh, fragmentation, fragmented, fragmented party system in the world. Um, and in a sense, it has helped, in my opinion, to block some of uh, Bolsonaro's most authoritarian uh projects or whatever and and this is uh, one of our functionalities that might i don't know might have worked um in a good way uh, in case of an authoritarian figure like bolsonaro and the other thing is that uh i just uh, there was a, a, a my column today for icon next uh i i wrote on polarization um and Usually, we of course we usually think that polarization is a bad thing for democracy. Um, but uh, in a case, for example, like Brazil right now, where you have uh, Lula kind of coming back, and he's really the enemy for Bolsonaro. Uh, the question is whether we should think of Bolsonaro as an adversary or and not an enemy, because of course he's an enemy of democracy. And in this case, uh, polarization kind of brings uh, coordination against uh, someone like Bolsonaro. So it's another kind of functionality that might be interesting for uh, protecting the democratic system in a way. So it's just like two very uh, problematic concepts that are usually connected to the electoral system, fragmentation and polarization. But it's sometimes they have they are more nuanced than you usually depict them. They might be a little bit more 
I, I don't know, in some cases it might work in, uh, in a good way. I don't know, it's just it can be a coincidence, can be good luck or whatever. Uh, the thing is, uh, in the case of Brazil, I think that they might be working in a positive way, even though it's a kind of a second best. It's not actually something good, but it's actually a kind of second best. I just want to add this uh, discussion. Maybe it might be interesting just to think of uh, these two concepts, fragmentation and polarization as uh, this functionality that in a case of an authoritarian figure might work. Ah, and just one other question. Uh, why in Brazil, it looks like Bolsonaro uh, won't be reelected uh, in comparison to cases like in Hungary or um, Venezuela where uh, they've been in power for much longer. Uh, this is something that is quite interesting. This, this makes the question is whether, uh, I don't think this is the answer, whether we have a greater institutionality. I don't think it is the case, but it's just a one thing to think of. And whether there might be another, I don't know, reason for that. And that's maybe, I don't know, when Ada or, or Keen, just a question just to add here for our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliano. João Vitor, and then Professor Kim for the three questions. Thank you, Professor Emilio, and thank you very much, Professor Kim Chappil, uh, for this thoughtful and insights and data that we certainly contribute to the understanding of the fate of political parties in our region. And I am talking uh, more about another backdrop about the Chilean case. And I would like to highlight the term toxicity in your presentation, because I think that this uh, term also mirrors many challenges that uh, democratic representation is, uh, challenges to democratic representation in Chile as well, a country with a highly institutionalized party system, which back in 2019, um, when bro protests um, sparked a movement to rewrite Chilean constitutions, and most people didn't believe in electoral democracy, Congress agreed to more inclusive mechanis mechanisms such as allowing independents unaffiliated with political parties to run, requiring gender parity um, among delegates in elected in this uh, constitutional convention and reserving 17 seats um, for indigenous peoples. So um, I am studying this, this phenomenon. So um, I would like to, you, you, you talked about uh, people want new, new faces and I'm sure that in Chile, it was hard to deny that the country was tired of traditional politicians and wanted some fresh faces. And well, um, now we're rewriting the constitution here and the Chilean sociologists uh, describe this rupture between uh, the party system and the civil society of, or the po political movements as a, the great rupture, which uh, brought about this uh, constitution making pro uh, process. So although we have all these new inclusive mechanisms, uh, now the convention is going towards an institutional deadlock. And uh, based on my own empirical work, which I'm developing my PhD. Uh, my question is that in order to understand individuals' hearts and minds, shouldn't we not consider also, besides this uh, positive partisanship, let's uh, say that way, we sh shouldn't we know the rise of a kind of negative partisans or anti-partisans to complement this big picture, which you describe it so well, of this uh, partisan decay. 
including if we talk about Brazil, if you think of, of, about Brazil, we, we will see that uh, nowadays every Democrat politician in Brazil is, is concerned now with who will overthrow Bolsonaro in 2022. And the ones who are not identified with these mainstream left-wing parties are concerned with who will be able to, bo to beat both Bolsonaro and Lula. And people, uh, this is a second question, are thinking that maybe we should amend the constitution and uh, in a way that we could maybe uh, have a, some sort of um, ranked choice system, which would allow uh, three candidates at this, the second run um, for the presidential elections. So uh, the question is, shouldn't we have some new categories about negative uh, partisanship? I mean, like, and, and we shouldn't we separate identity and institutional scaffolds or organizations? Like, we have a negative anti-establishment identity. We have a partisanship identity. I mean, we have people who are uh, anti-establishment. Uh, identifiers also. And this is, these are new challenges, not only to Brazil, but for constitutional democracy all over the world. Thank you. Kim, please. Uh, yeah, and I also wanna hear from Desiree because I think that a lot of Thomas's comments were directed also, you know, at your analysis of the Brazilian situation. So I don't know, maybe, maybe you should go first. I'm not sure, Thomas, if you can say that all begins with the, the impeachment or the parliamentary coup. I think maybe before that, when the Leticia that is here with us wrote about it in her thesis, maybe when the, the, the candidate that lost the election for Dilma in 2014 said he won't he would not concede, it was a very strong problem. And we had uh, a, a very use of the, pop, the populist grammar in judicial decisions since then. So I, I'm not sure that it was the coup or the impeachment that marked the, this transition and prepared the field for Bolsonaro. I studied the electoral behavior since 86 in the, the composition of the chambers of deputies. And we as electorate, we used to, to prefer representatives for, uh, from the right, the right wing. It was a constant since then. So I, I'm not sure that we can say that elections of Bolsonaro was, uh, um, a point out of the curve, or it was only a series of unfortunate events. I think we, we are in this path a long time, from a long time, so we have to, to, to know how to, to change that. Maybe you can see the, the government, the democratic governments of this era as a, an exception and not the, the other way around. And what Juliano said about the elections of next year that we are thinking about don't have Bolsonaro as a, a potential candidate with a chance, I think it's more hope and faith than a, a objective analysis. Maybe you can trust on the electoral authority to make him um, impossible to, to, to present his, his candidate, his name as a, an alternative in the, the conclusion of the judgments about political power and everything that was uh, that stated it was a, a frauded election. But I'm not sure that we can rely on that, Julian. Maybe uh, we, can, we need to, to believe that electorate will have a more intelligent posture next year and uh, and they can make a better chance, a better choice. So we have to believe or in the system or in the, the people. And I'm, I'm, I'm willing to believe in the people in this moment. Maybe they don't fail 
the politics again. <laughs> that's that's more optimistic than I took you to be in your actual presentation, though. So, you know, we're kind of, uh, as they say, we're stuck with the people that we have, right? And I guess what I what I'm trying to raise is the question of whether first we have the people and then we get the institutions they deserve, or whether it's the other way around. And I'm trying to push the idea that it's kind of the other way around, which is that the institutions create the democratic citizens in lots of ways by you know, structuring their choices by sort of educating them or not, <laughs> by, um, you know, presenting them with a set of, of possibilities that they wouldn't have dreamed up on their own, right? So this is, and, and plus, you know, coming from a sort of constitutional angle, it just seems to me that one of the things that, that those of us who work on constitutions can think about is how we build these structures to make better people. <laughs> You know, not because we're engineering in the old Soviet sense of the, the new Soviet man or whatever, but because democracies aren't, aren't I mean, democracies have to be grown and nurtured. So the question is how we do that. And, and, and that's where I think that, um, you know, what I'm struck by in Thomas's comments is that, you know, Bolsonaro said terrible things and so did Trump. And, you know, when I, I, I put the two of them in a, in a box in part because, nobody could have been surprised when they came in and kept doing the exact same thing they did during the campaign. So how can I possibly be right that voters never vote for these stupid things? Well, at least what happened in the US with Trump was that many people said, oh, but when he actually becomes president, he'll stop doing that. Or he'll have advisors around him who will mean that you know they'll stop him from doing the bad things. Or they say, yeah, he talks like that, but you know, we need things shaken up and, you know, you have to, whatever the, the expression is, you have to break eggs to make an omelet or whatever. And so, but a lot of it was minimizing the damage that, that Trump could cause. And I'm wondering whether there was minimizing the damage that Bolsonaro could cause on the, on the part of the people who voted for him, right? Which is to say they weren't agreeing with Bolsonaro. They were voting for him despite what he said. And that's the phenomenon that I'm really interested in, right? Those are voters who were not totally on board. Those are voters who could vote for some other option if there were one, because they're not full, full blast into that candidate. And so this is where I think that these concepts of fragmentation and polarization are a big part of the story. So fragmentation, because in the first round of Brazilian elections, you've got so many candidates <laughs> that there's not, it, it may be too much to, um, to, to educate people about all the options that are available. So like one thing that, that I, because I'm following the German election, which is this Sunday where there are not as many parties as in Brazil, but still quite a few, <clears throat> they have this votomatic thing where a voter can get online and they're asked a bunch of, I think it's 23 questions in the German case. Do you agree with this, that, or the other thing? Do you agree with, and the voters fill out the questionnaire and then at the end, it tells them which political party is closest to their views. So that's one way to sort through a lot of parties, you know, with a kind of simple tool. And apparently there are millions of people who have accessed this tool in Germany in advance of the election. So maybe that's, you know, I'm just thinking, could we engineer something that concentrates people or educates them about the nature of parties that keeps them focused on issues and off personalities, you know, because someone like Bolsonaro or someone like Trump, like they're great entertainers, right? For, I mean, those of us that they don't drive crazy, everybody else kind of, it's like watching a reality show. You know, it just so happens your government is getting destroyed in the process, but you know, it's entertaining. So we have to figure out how to buffer ourselves from these charismatic, entertaining people who are not qualified to run a government, right? And something like this votomatic thing, um, maybe some, you know, possibility. But this is where polarization comes in. So um, I have a slide, not uh, which I was trying to find, but um, when you looked at, at who voted for Trump in 2016 in the US, and, and then the Trump voters were asked, so why did you vote for Trump? And they were given a bunch of alternatives and ditto with the Hillary voters, like why did you vote for Hillary? And overwhelmingly, <laughs> the most common reason people gave, um, wild majorities, it's like 70% in both cases, said the reason why I voted for her was that she wasn't him. And the reason why I voted for him is that he wasn't her, which is to say it was negative voting, right? It was voting against the other candidate more than it was voting for the 
the one who actually won. And again, that's a bad situation, right? You shouldn't just be voting to keep someone out of power. You should be voting because you agree with the person you're voting for. And, you know, in the American election data, what it shows is that agreement with their positions ran a very distant second to the, they're not the other person. And that's the polarization, right? Where people get, get built, uh, people are sort of um, identified with political camps, you know, so that we're going to vote for whoever's carrying our flag, you know, against the other people, regardless of who they put up, you know, we also learned in the American election that overwhelmingly the people who voted for Trump were people who voted for all the other Republican candidates who weren't like Trump in prior elections, <laughs> right? So it's so the tribalism of I will vote for whoever's carrying this flag is also something that if somebody else comes in carrying that flag because the party didn't screen them out is part of what's happening here. So polarization, I think, also makes a, makes a big difference. And then just finally on the on the anti-partisans, I mean, I guess that's, it goes with polarization, right? That, that I, I will vote just in order to keep this one out, <laughs> you know? And so that's also something you see that grows before you have these breakdowns of party systems. And so I guess I keep coming back to, I, I guess I'm, I don't know, I, I'm a little more persuaded of my own argument, maybe at the end of all of this, which is that there are good reasons and bad reasons to vote for parties. And very often the, in these broken or transitioning party systems, people see more reasons to vote negatively than to vote positively. They vote holding their noses, you know, like even though Bolsonaro said this stuff, even though Trump said this stuff, even though, you know, Orban said this stuff, people vote anyway right, for these candidates. And those are bad democratic reasons, you know, so it still tells you the system's broken. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping that there are ways to, to, to do something with institutional design. Like, for example, requiring parties to have platforms. Trump didn't have a platform last time. Orban hasn't had a platform since 2010. Parties are not having platforms anymore. <laughs> you know, And so some way of trying to hold them to substantive views and not just reality show appearances would also be you know, an improvement. So, so in other words, I do think democratic systems are broken, but I don't think they're broken because these autocrats who come to power and deconstruct constitutional democracy were what people wanted when they voted for them, right? And if that's true, then there's some hope because we can try to get the, the voters because ultimately, it, I mean, I told you the era of coups is over, right? You don't want some external force coming in and toppling a bad government because people have lost the power to do it themselves. You want there to be elections that will produce better results later. So to keep this stuff on a democratic track, we have to figure out how to offer in these systems better alternatives so that we can get out of this through peaceful democratic means. And maybe there's some hope. I'll have more questions in the chat that we are running out of time. Let me just find the first one. Just a second, please. So the first one was done by uh, Nayana at uh, YouTube. She's asking a tricky question. Is there any recipe to keep democracy alive as we face daily so many authoritarian threats? Is there any remedy for Brazilian democracy con to contain? The authoritarianism of current uh, of the current president, and then uh, we have here uh, Rafaela. She's asking. Uh, she says that uh, she loved the conference uh, and the cartoons. Uh, your article on autocrat autocratic legalism is incredible. And then uh, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, the importance of an independent judiciary. However. During Trump's administration, we saw the Supreme Court's uh, extensively use of uh, shadow docket in a way that uh, strengthened Trump's policies and positions. What do you think uh, about it? Uh, I, I would like to add just a, a small question, Professor uh, uh, Kim. Uh, you talked about in, in a conference for the National University of Singapore uh, on an idea of uh, counter constitution. Uh, yeah. I think that is a very important concept because Many of the people that declare themselves as uh, voters of Trump or Bolsonaro, 
And then they are asked, uh, do you prefer authoritarianism or democracy? They say, no, we prefer democracy, but they prefer the kind of democracy Trump or Bolsonaro offers. They say that uh, this kind of politics or, or, or programs or political programs, they are democratic. So uh, I, I was wondering how to connect it, uh, connect this kind of uh, position with your idea of counter uh, constitution. Uh, yeah, so thank you. So just to take um, those those three, so is there a recipe for making this better? Well, if there is one, it's going to have to be adjusted for local conditions, you know. So it seems to me um, that one of the best things can happen to Brazil is Lula's coming back. I mean, this doesn't mean I agree with Lula. It just means that Lula is also one of these giant charismatic personalities, you know, and if what people are voting for are giant charismatic personalities, then having two of them is better than having one of them in a campaign and just getting power out of Bolsonaro's hands, as long as it doesn't go into the hands of another autocrat is an improvement. And at least, you know, you guys know Lula better than I do, but you know, what I was impressed by was how he was a revolutionary. He was, you know, but he also stepped down when the term limits were up. Right. I mean, so he hasn't, at least so far as I can see, really shown himself to be a constitution breaker, you know, in the same way that Bolsonaro seems to be. So, you know, I'm not trying to endorse any presidential candidate in, in, in Brazil, except to say that that you, you can't beat something. You can't beat something with nothing. Right. So you need to have electoral competition that really is attractive to voters to pull them away from the guy that you're trying to get rid of. So I think that that's helpful. Um, so then um, on the independence of court, so this has come up a few times. And actually, I, when I was, I was a bit involved this, this summer in, um, in talking to the folks in Chile about the constitutional drafting process, because they were thinking about getting rid of their constitutional court. And I tried to make an argument for keeping it, but transforming it. So here's the thing about judiciaries. I mean, I and I've changed my position over the years on this. I wish Mark was still here because we've argued about this before. But so courts are really crucial as independent institutions that stand outside politics and enforce the rules of the game. <clears throat> the problem is that if courts are captured, then everything falls, <laughs> right? Because everything rests on them. So we need a backup to courts. And so I just argued, uh, we have this com presidential commission in the United States thinking about whether the Supreme Court should be modified. And of course, the big proposal on the table is to pack it with more judges because the Republicans packed it, so now the Democrats want to pack in, in, you know, in exchange. And one of the things I argued for instead was to say the reason why the, why the Supreme Court in the U.S. is under this pressure is because we have this impossible to amend constitution. So when the Supreme Court makes a decision, the only way you can overcome it is to head through this process that will always fail. So therefore, the only way to change a decision of the Supreme Court is to capture the court. <laughs> it puts too much at stake in the court. So I can't believe I did this, but I stood in front of this commission, well, stood on Zoom, right, in front of this commission and said, what we need in the US is an override mechanism like in Canada. So, you know, we have, um, a president, uh, we have a congressional override of a presidential veto. Why can't we have a congressional override of a judicial decision? You know, again, it takes two thirds of each chamber for the presidential veto, maybe the same, but that's a lot easier than a constitutional amendment, right? So, what we need to do is to think about how to take the stress off the one institution that's holding everything up, <laughs> you know, especially if there's nowhere to go to to change its decision. So again, it's extending checks and balances. So if the courts have become too powerful and or corrupted or too much involved in politics so that people just think they're political actors wearing robes, then it seems to me there needs to be another way to maybe the constitution should be easier to amend so that if they're making constitutional rulings, there's another way to go to get around them if they become part of the problem, right? So I guess I'm just thinking that the solution to that is, is more checks and balances, checks and balances against each of the institutions that now has a final say. Because at best, you know, what you can do is just keep the problem moving through the system, hoping that there'll be, it'll intersect with elections well enough to produce a good result at some point, <laughs> right? So we just have to prevent these institutions from, um, from getting, uh, captured, um, I think. And so 
Um, and and then I whoops, I, I think I didn't answer something, but um, oh, shadow docket. Yes, I'm against it. Um, oh, rank choice voting. And again, we need to think more creatively about election rules. And uh, rank choice voting is now like a hot thing, but it really depends on what your party system is like. Um, it depends on, you know, will rank choice, choice voting produce the, the terrible candidate, which nobody likes as your first choice, just because, I don't know. I mean, you can imagine that there are situations in which rank choice voting leads you into the problem rather than out of it. So all these things have to be tailored for local conditions, you know, and that's why election rules are so hard and so easy to rig. You know, um, I can send you a piece I did on Orban's election rules for the 2014 election. Um, you know, all, those rules would only have produced the terrible outcome they did in a landscape that looked like the one Hungary had. Otherwise, it might have been a perfectly sane system somewhere. So election rules are really technical, complicated, and where a lot of the action is. So I think we should all become election law specialists. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Kim. Uh, I think that uh, we are just in time now, almost uh, two hours of, uh, of a session. Uh, that is more than we have here with the other seminars. But uh, thank you again so much, Professor Kim. Uh, it was a great, great uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, Desiree, for your participation. Very good comments. Uh, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you for all the audience here, everyone who joined us. Uh, all the professors and researchers. We will be going with the other seminars. Please stay tuned. Uh, and we will be publishing uh, uh, quickly this, those results. Uh, I guess the, the, the YouTube uh, link will be available for you and other uh, people who wanted uh, to see it. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And definitely, thank you so much. Those are brilliant comments. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It was an honor to be here. Thank you very <laughs> much, Emilio, for, for this too. opportunity.